I joined the Ministry of Defence pretty much straight from school in 1985 and the philosophy at the time was that they give you uh, two or three years in a particular post and then they move you on. Uh, the idea was that you would do, say, a tour of duty in, in policy, a tour of duty in finance, one in contracts, one in personnel, and they would try to uh, encourage people to have a fairly broad base, um, then maybe specialise later in their, their career. So I'd done two or three different jobs, um, and then in 1990, um, after the uh, Saddam Hussein invasion of, of Kuwait, uh, I was seconded from Secretariat Air Staff, where I was doing a job where the duties included uh, briefings for senior um, personnel visiting Air Force bases. Um, I had some responsibilities to do with military aircraft accidents, but I was seconded out of that and into the Joint Operations Centre. I was working in a part of that called the Air Force Operations Room, dealing with, with real-time operational information um, to do with the build-up to, uh, and then in, in 1991, uh, the Gulf War um, itself, the first Gulf War. Yeah. Effectively, I was, I was a briefer. I would get information, it would be um, to, to do with the RAF, so it would be um, bombing raids, any um, casualties or losses, uh, battle damage assessment, etc., etc., and the the key thing was the um, the daily briefs for ministers and uh, the service chiefs, and and my job was to take raw data and to, to as, as it were, yes, to to craft it into to something succinct, um, accurate that quickly gave those senior decision makers the information that they needed. Um, while I was doing that job, um, uh, certainly I think in the early part of 1991, the person that I was most directly working to said, look, I understand that before you were uh, pulled out of your old job and uh, seconded uh, down here, you had expressed an interest in, in moving on from yeah. your old job. He said, I may have a job um, coming up after the war. Um, and that job was the UFO job. Right. So he said, uh, would you be interested, because we had a fairly good working relationship, he said, would you be interested in taking that job up? I, I think part of me, part of me felt that I, I had actually been looking for a move. So yeah. th there was, at a certain extent, I was saying, yeah, yeah I, I wanted to move anyway. Yeah. Uh -huh. To another, an, another part of me thought, the UFO job? What on earth is that all about? <laughs> and I think I was so intrigued um, that we even had a UFO job, yeah. uh, that for a number of reasons, and I probably now uh, can't put my finger on the exact decision-making process, but to cut a long story short, I said yes, the offer did actually materialise, and, and then in um, the summer of 1991, uh, I actually started work on the UFO project. I didn't really have a detailed picture of, of what working on the UFA project would involve. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that the bread and butter of, of that part of the job was effectively to research and investigate the UFO phenomenon and the Ministry of Defence's uh, party line, yeah. as it were, was that uh, these things are investigated so that, that we can come to a, a judgement on whether any of the, the UFO sightings might suggest anything of, of any defence significance, mm -hmm. any for example, a potential threat to the yeah. defence of the UK. Uh, but I didn't know um, much more than the standard policy and that I would be investigating UFOs. I didn't know really the mythology, uh, the, the methodology of an investigation. I didn't uh, know what sorts of cases I would come across. I certainly didn't know any of the history of the British government's involvement in, in this subject. I'd had Obviously, I've gone for a chat about the job, but it's not until you actually start uh, and that you have uh, the traditional, and back, back then it was a one-week handover, where you actually sit alongside um, the previous incumbent mm -hmm. and effectively shadow him yeah. uh, for a week and, and then take over um, the following week. It wasn't until I was actually doing that, sitting at the desk, going through some of the old files, uh, taking some calls, um, that I really began to get a flavour of what was involved. 
in, in a sense, that's good. I didn't really have any yep. preconceived uh, beliefs mm -hmm. on the subject. I certainly had very little knowledge. I possibly come across Charles Belitz's book on the Bermuda Triangle when I was a kid, yep. which from recollection had a, a chapter on UFOs. But um, I, I was certainly not a buff or believer or, or, or whatever. Neither was I a complete hardened sceptic um, thinking this is complete nonsense. So I went in there in a sense uh, with an open mind, but, but frankly not expecting to find, shall we say, little green men. Um, so that, that was my, my mindset. Of, co of course UFOs exist, I mean, uh, because of, uh, in its literal sense a UFO is simply an unidentified flying object and, and therefore because people do see UFOs, there is a UFO phenomenon, whatever one thinks lies behind it, and we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll get onto that. So UFOs are seen and reported in, in their tens of thousands, yeah. that's, that's a, an undeniable fact, and some of the witnesses, as we'll discuss, include pilots, military officers, uh, police, etc., etc. Um, I think the question is, perhaps, um, does having a UFO project imply a belief, That's say, in something exotic, yeah. even extraterrestrial? Mm -hmm. but the, the answer I'd like to give about this, if you'll forgive a little soundbite, is that there isn't a corporate belief in Martians, but no. there is a corporate belief in Russians. Right. Um, now, it's it's interesting that the UFO phenomenon, um, obviously people have seen strange things in the sky throughout recorded human history, and I'm sure through unrecorded human history as well. Um, the MOD's UFO project has its roots in something that happened in 1950, and I think it's it's interesting just to for me to explain this, because I think it gives you the the, the mindset be behind why the MOD, and really why all governments that have dabbled in this subject mm -hmm. are involved. Sure. Um, the then chief scientific advisor, um, the great radar scientist Sir Henry Tizard, Winston Churchill after the war had brought him back into government and he was chief scientific advisor at the MOD and he said that UFO reports were obviously being received uh, from all around the world yeah. and were you know, obviously in the UK as well. He said, we ought not dismiss these reports without some form of proper scientific study. Yeah. Um, and that was about as far as, as his statement went, but it, it probably gives you um, the, the quickest and easiest answer into why governments and the military look at these things. Yeah. Um, we don't know what they are, uh, but rather than just guessing or dismissing, uh, common sense dictates, particularly if the reports suggest structured craft with speeds and manoeuvres going ahead of anything we've got, um, at least we should be taking a look at that. Yeah. And that's that's what Sir Henry Tizard said, and indeed that's why as a result of his um, initiative the MOD set up something called the Flying Saucer Working Party. Always a great that's great. It's absolutely, yeah. it's the most marvellously named committee in the history of, of the civil service, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. Um, and we've had a few odd ones. Um, interestingly, its conclusions were fairly sceptical and reflect, to a fairly large extent, the, the government's position on, on the subject to this day. Yeah, no, In no. other words, we believe most of these things can be explained as, yeah. as misidentifications of known objects or phenomena. Um, as hoaxes or as psychological delusions of, of some sort. Um, and we, we've seen no evidence to suggest that, that there's anything uh, that makes the UFO uh, subject worthy of any, any further study. We recommend a discontinuation uh, of, of this research and investigation effort. The plug was pulled. Uh, a matter of months later, um, the RAF found itself in the, in the centre of a series of fairly high profile sightings where UFOs were being tracked on radar, uh, being seen uh, by pilots when their aircraft were scrambled to try and intercept these things. Yeah. And the MOD was dragged, I think Reluctant. a little bit reluctantly, yeah. um, some would say kicking and screaming, back into the UFO uh -huh. uh, subject and has pretty much, uh, until or fairly recently, um, had a UFO project of one way, shape or form uh -huh. um, 
to, to the present day, yeah. uh, with the brief being fairly constant, research and investigate the phenomenon, uh, see if there's evidence of a threat. Yeah, defence significance, ultimately where it boils down. Exactly. Is there anything of any defence significance? Mm -hmm. And I think the sceptics within the MOD, and it's important to say that this whole sceptic versus believer debate has taken place as much at the MOD and in government as it has anywhere else, yeah. whether it's it's media, whether it's UFO researchers or, or anything. Um, but the, the, the sceptical MOD line would be uh, UFOs are of, quote, no defence significance. But again, there are plenty of senior uh, politicians and military personnel who, who say, no, we believe that the UFO phenomenon is of extreme defence significance. my words carefully and, and of course not yet too far into to any operational yeah. business um, but I think you can take it as, as a, a, a matter of public record that UFOs um, have been tracked on radar uh, on numerous occasions and there are uh, plenty of documents at the National Archives um, both in Britain, in America, and indeed I'm sure in all sorts of other countries recording cases where precisely that has happened. UFOs have been tracked on radar. Yes, if uh, the radar operators, the fighter controllers, then uh, assess uh, that radar return as, as being solid, and if it's not obviously using a, a, a transponder so we can't actually identify it um, as, as uh, an aircraft, um, yes, a judgment call will be made, and that judgment call may be uh, scramble the aircraft, um, be they the ones kept on quick reaction alert or be they uh, any other uh, fighter interceptors, um, and go and take a look. It, it happened very famously, for example, in Belgium in, in 1989 and in, particularly in, in 1990 on, on March 30th and 31st when the Belgians tracked a UFO on radar, two F-16 fighters were scrambled, uh, they uh, attempted to uh, lock on to the UFO with their airborne radars, which they succeeded in doing. So the UFO was being simultaneously tracked by ground-based radars belonging to uh, both the Belgian Air Force and indeed some radars which were integrated into the NATO uh, network, and indeed, as I say, by the pilots themselves on their separate airborne radar. Every time they achieved lock-on, the UFO seemed to break the lock and be capable of um, evading the aircraft. They tried to and succeeded in re reacquiring uh, on a number of occasions. And this game, as it were, of cat and mouse played itself out in, in the Belgian skies for um, some considerable time. Observers on the ground, um, including a number of um, uh, police, said that they could actually see and hear the aircraft, they could see the UFO, yeah. um, and they could see this unfolding. Um, and they said every time the aircraft looked as if they were getting close, the UFO seemed to be capable of moving away at great speeds. That's, that's a fairly famous case, but there are many, many other cases, a lot of them um, in, in the 50s, where, where perhaps the Cold War and, and people's nervousness about um, uh, Soviet aircraft probing our, our defences um, was, was at its height. Yeah. Um, but plenty of cases on the public record, a uh, number of pilots have spoken out quite publicly about being involved in these, these intercepts. Um, so yes, these things do happen. I've spoken to, to civil pilots um, who've, who've seen these sorts of things. Uh, Graham, Graham Shepard yep. was a, 
uh, an interesting example, a senior British uh, Airways captain who'd had two spectacular UFO sightings in 1967, which was of course a, a, a big year for UFO sightings um, all around the world, but particularly in America and Britain. Um, I've spoken to military pilots who were involved um, in intercepts. I've spoken, interestingly, uh, to military pilots who've seen UFOs who never reported it. Um, and again, perhaps, we'll, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a little about uh, numbers of reports and, and such like, but um, you know, these things go on. The, one of my most interesting conversations um, was actually with a, um, somebody at the RAF, um, uh, the, the um, uh, Ballistic Missile Early Warning uh, Center, yeah. at RAF Filingdales, and he said, from time to time, he said, we see meteorites and fireballs yeah. on our space tracking radar. He said, they do speeds of about 17,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And I said, simple question, I said, how do you know they're um, so meteorites and fireballs? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, because they go very fast. <laughs> so, so there was a sort of, well, what else could there be tone yeah. of voice? Mm -hmm. But that's interesting because it goes to the heart of, of something which I feel quite strongly about. Um, what's equally important in looking at the UFO phenomenon, the way in which the military respond to it, it's not just the equipment, yeah. i.e. your radar systems, be they um, uh, space tracking radars or, or be they more conventional uh, air traffic control or military radars, it's actually the training mm -hmm. and the mindset of, of the people operating this. Um, it's well known, and I can't go into obviously too much detail, but it's well known that, for example, you can use filter programs on radar um, to filter out anything that goes faster than a certain speed, right. uh, lower than a certain speed, yeah. um, because all the time your radars are configured for what you're expecting to That's see, right. yeah. what you're actually looking for. Mm -hmm. Anything that doesn't conform can be filtered out by, by a computer program now, but the important thing is um, there's also a filter program up here. Um, and, and I think people's minds sometimes um, say, well, that's interesting, I've got a, an anomalous return on my radar system, but then it just faded away. Well, people know radar is it's not an exact science. You can get um, a false return because of temperature inversion. A flock of birds in yeah. some circumstances will give you a return, the flock dissipates, the return disappears. Yeah. But it's, it's all too easy. I think for your, your belief system to kick in, and if it doesn't behave like a conventional aircraft, the filter program in your mind yeah. can filter it out. I wonder sometimes how many interesting UFO cases have been lost because of that, because of that mindset. Now, now, I'll do a boring statistical bit, but I'll give you, um, I'll make the point for, for a reason. Um, Doing my job at the MOD, I got about two or three hundred UFO reports each year. Now, of course, that was just in the UK. My yeah. brief was just um, national, not global. Um, I wasn't, of course, the only person getting UFO reports. Some people would report to local media. Yeah. Some people would report to one of the civilian UFO groups. Uh, well, the police, the police or the military, we, we did have a national reporting system. Yeah. Anyone who reported a UFO to a police station, to a military base or to a civil airport, there was a standing operating procedure uh, whereby those details should be recorded and the cases should be sent to the, the MOD for investigation. Yeah. Now, having said that, it was clear to me that, that that system was operating in a fairly patchy way. Um, it needed beefing up. Some yeah. people had clearly lost the the standard operating procedure um, and I've spoken to some police forces who said oh we, we just treat these as hoax calls or crank calls and I said no no yeah, there's a, a procedure you're yeah. supposed to record these and forward them to us but but the point is there was a national reporting system but as I say some UFO reports go to the media some go to the UFO groups um, most people won't actually report at all. Mm. Two reasons, yes. fear of ridicule yeah. and simply not understanding where to or actually make a report. Yeah. Yes. Who, 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 do, who are you going to call? Yeah. So you could figure that my two or three hundred reports are obviously just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Um, and I've seen this for myself at uh, even at UFO conferences where you, you know that you're drawing in enthusiasts and people who've got a natural interest. Um, I've seen it done with a show of, show of hands. Um, how many people um, 
in the audience, um, the speakers will, will ask, have, have seen a UFO? Then the follow-up question is, uh, how many of you um, made an official report um, and, or, or indeed made a report to anyone? Yeah. Those people keep your hands up. Everyone else who didn't report it put your hands down. Most of the hands go down. We only study a very small uh, part of, of the potentially available data. But here's the interesting thing, that happens as much with the military um, as, as anyone else. Even though the military should and, and frankly do know full well mm -hmm. that there is a standard operating procedure and that they're mandated to make a report. I've spoken to pilots who've said to me, look Nick, he said, I've seen you have others. Um, and some pretty interesting sightings. One of them said to me on the course, he said, look, I, I saw a UFO, it casually overtook my aircraft, it wasn't a light, it was a craft. Um, I obviously can't go into huge details about prototype aircraft, but he was fairly sure it wasn't anything, not one of ours. Yeah. Um, but he said, I didn't report it, and I said, why not? He made a, a little joke, of, he said, I didn't want to be known as flying saucer Fred for the rest of my Air Force career. <laughs> now, yeah. if that mindset is prevalent in the military, yeah. when they know about the process of making official reports, um, how many other spectacular reports are there out there, both involving pilots, radar operators, or members of the public, that we just sadly never got to hear about at all? A lot, I would suggest. Uh, this particular one caught my eye. Um, as you say, a flight of Tornado um, R RAF uh, jets had been casually overtaken uh, by a UFO, which they described as a sort of delta or diamond-shaped craft um, with an unusual configuration of lights on it. Um, there was some speculation that it was a, a stealth aircraft or, or some such object, but um, there was, uh, for some reason or the other, and it's, it's not really appropriate to speculate, there didn't seem to be much follow-up of the incident. So the MOD's file um, contains little other than the report from the pilots themselves. But um, knowing what we now know about um, uh, the speed of a stealth and the configuration of, of lights, um, that explanation doesn't seem to fit. Some people have proposed um, that a, a potential satellite re-entry uh, might explain uh, the, the UFO sighting as well. But again, um, space junk re-enters the Earth's atmosphere um, a, a lot of the time. And I've spoken to a lot of scientists about this. And what you get is a sort of high altitude firework display. You don't get what these RAF uh, pilots reported. Uh, a solid structured craft uh, actually coming from behind the aircraft, uh, in front of the aircraft, and then accelerating away. Um, so that didn't seem to fit either. Um, intriguingly, the date of the, um, uh, the, the UFO sighting was 5th of November, so um, you know some people said, well, maybe it was a big firework um, for our God Fork celebrations, but um, I, that was obviously just a joke. No, this is just one of a number of uh, cases involving military witnesses um, where to this day uh, there is no satisfactory explanation uh, for what's seen. It's a shame that there wasn't more follow-up but uh, you know I think the, uh, the UFO project's files and I'm sure the files uh, indeed of Project Blue Book are littered with, with intriguing cases like that which perhaps weren't followed up as much as they should have been. Halfway through my tour of duty uh, in March of 1993, there was a major wave of UFO sightings over the United Kingdom and indeed over other parts um, of Europe. I came into work on the 31st of March and uh, the phone was ringing. I picked it up. It was a police officer down in, in um, Devon. He explained to me how he and his colleague had seen a, a UFO. 
So of course I, I took the details of, of the report and began to investigate. Um, pretty much as soon as I, I started that, the phone rang again, another UFO report came in. Again, another police officer. Um, the reports came in thick and fast throughout the, uh, the, the day, uh, and indeed over the next few days. And it was, it was soon clear that this was, was a major wave of, of UFO sightings. That because quite a lot of the sightings had happened at night, uh, a lot of the witnesses were police officers on, on night patrol. Now, of course, there's no such thing as an infallible witness, but inevitably trained observers such as uh, police officers, um, military personnel, pilots who, who will have an idea of, of what things look like in the sky, speeds, uh, heights, distances, inevitably some witnesses are better than others. So it was interesting that there was a high proportion of police officers reporting this to me. The earliest UFO report came from, uh, it was 30th of March 1993 and it was about 8.30 in the evening. That was from a, funnily enough, an off-duty police officer who was actually leading a, a troop of, of um, uh, scouts out on, on outside um, activity. Um, and he saw an object which he described as almost being like two Concorde aircraft uh, stuck together. Uh, so a, a pretty massive uh, craft. The interesting thing in all of this it goes back to an interesting point about the under-reporting of UFOs. Sometimes when people say how many UFOs were, I mean, how many reports do you have for that night, um, you might have one piece of paper on your desk that you treat as a, an individual report, but at the bottom there'd be a throwaway line, as for example there was with one of the police reports, and it said, um, I know from monitoring my radio that um, dozens of, of police colleagues throughout Devon and Cornwall um, saw the same thing. Uh, and interestingly, again, with this um, um, uh, scout group, again, we didn't have individual reports from, from all, all the boys. So, so the number of people who'd actually seen this thing over a course of several hours, the, the last report was at about um, uh, 2.40 in the morning, uh, on the 31st. Uh, so this, this UFO, whatever it was, had been operating over the UK for a period of several hours. Uh, the number of witnesses uh, clearly ran into hundreds, but of course again, um, UFOs are majorly under-reported. Now, the critically interesting point to me about this case, and it was something of a turning point. I, th I think sometimes it's been said this is the case that turned me from sceptic to believer. I think that's a, a, an oversimplification, but it was certainly a case that had um, a profound effect on me and, and made me um, hopefully more open-minded to some of the more exotic possibilities. Uh, the UFO flew over two military bases, RAF Cosford and RAF Shawbury. It was seen by a patrol of uh, Air Force police officers at the first base, and then it was seen by the meteorological officer at the second base. Now this was a man with eight years experience in the Air Force. As a Met officer, his job was looking into the sky. Um, he was based at um, an Air Force station. He saw aircraft and helicopters on a frequent basis. Um, so this is uh, probably about as uh, a good an observer as, as you can get in, in terms of not the sort of person to misidentify. He described to me a vast triangular shaped UFO moving slowly over the uh, fields, coming towards the base. He said there was a narrow beam of light firing from the craft. That beam of light was tracking from side to side, he said, as, as if the UFO was looking for something. He said there was a low frequency humming sound coming from the UFO. And he said it was one of those unpleasant sounds that you could feel um, in your chest as well as hear. He, he likened it to standing in front of a bass speaker that sort of effect. Um, and as he was describing this to me when, when I interviewed him, he, um, he was clearly quite shaken up by this and, and he said that this was unlike anything he'd, he'd ever seen before. And, and quite what I could tell this, this chap. And, and incidentally, he said that um, the UFO had been moving fairly slowly. Um, 
20 or 30 miles an hour and, and then suddenly had shot away to the horizon um, many, many times faster than a fast jet. Um, and that's a consistent description from many witnesses in, in um, some of the most compelling of UFO cases. But here it was being relayed to me firsthand by uh, an Air Force witness. Um, what was I supposed to say to him? Um, sorry, it was just a weather balloon. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, um, of course, I launched a full investigation. Um, we, we checked all the usual um, sorts of activities that give rise to misidentifications. We, at any given time, have a, an idea of what's flying in our airspace. Um, we look at flight paths. Uh, we look at um, the radar data. Of course, I, I ordered the tapes being pounded and sent to me at uh, Ministry of Defence headquarters. We looked at those radar tapes. I, I uh, worked with some specialist radar staffs in, in the, the Air Force. We looked at the data. Um, there were some inconclusive readings uh, that might have explained, or, or rather might have corroborated some of the sightings, um, but radar is an inexact science. The particular radar head um, is one that uh, was prone to picking up um, ground clutter, as I say, tall buildings under certain meteorological conditions. So the honest answer was, yes, there is something on the radar, but whether it's the UFO and we've tracked it or not, the, there's nothing you could really um, take, take to the bank. Um, this went up the chain of command through my head of division um, to the assistant chief of the air staff, one of, one of Britain's most senior military officers. Um, he said, as often happened with the most interesting UFO cases, this was almost the catch-22, um, because we'd done such a detailed investigation, um, the reply was, well, this is extremely interesting, but there is really nothing else that we can do by, by way of taking this forward, um, but noted with interest. Uh, object unexplained, case closed. Um, or rather, I say case closed, in effect, case uh, like an unsolved murder, perhaps, uh, forever open, but, but effectively unresolved. Um, whether we'll get what the police would call a, a cold case review, and whether we'll go back and reopen investigations, um, as I did from time to time with other cases, I don't know. One interesting postscript to this story is that I recently was uh, heavily involved with and, and presented a, a programme on uh, British network television on one of the prime channels, uh, devoting a, an hour to an investigative documentary about this case. Following the broadcast of that programme, I received personally another 25 reports uh, from witnesses who had seen this UFO um, either on the night concerned or, or at some stage before and since, um, seen uh, the, the same sort of vast triangular shaped craft um, and had never previously come forward or reported to anyone. So there, there perhaps is uh, some further work we can do. Whether we'll ever explain that case or not, I don't know. As ever, um, sceptics have, have tried to perhaps shoehorn one or two things into it. Uh, there was a re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere of um, a Russian uh, rocket that night, but that occurred at a very precise time and would have given a, a sort of high altitude fireworks display. Um, and even the uh, director of, of an observatory here in the UK has actually said he doesn't think uh, although he's sceptical about UFOs, he doesn't think, from what he knows about this case, that that could explain it. Or if it did, it could only explain a handful of the high-altitude sightings, but many of the witnesses saw a vast, triangular-shaped metallic craft at low altitude. Um, one of Britain's most compelling UFO cases, without a doubt.
Yes, I mean, to me, Rendlesham was always um, the most important case in, in the history of the British government's UFO project. And indeed, I reopened the investigation into it to try and do, again, what a police officer would call a cold case review to, to try and see, did we miss anything first time round? Uh, is, is there new evidence that we can find on this? And uh, yeah, it's, it's a critically important case because it um, involved um, military witnesses and it wasn't just a one-off, it happened over a series of nights. It's interesting, there's an interesting piece of um, uh, psychology, as it were, that um, when people try, as they sometimes do, to downplay this, uh, this sighting, uh, they, they refer to the fact that the official report um, is, is titled Unexplained Lights. When you actually read the official report that is in, entitled Unexplained Lights, it makes it fully clear that what we're dealing with was a landed metallic craft. And on the first night, um, uh, lights in the forest were seen, Patrol thought that maybe one of the uh, aircraft from the two bases involved, RAF Bentwaters and RAF Wood Woodbridge, uh, twin bases under a unified command separated by Rendlesham Forest, uh, they thought one of the aircraft had come down, they went out to investigate, they, they saw this landed metallic craft um, moving through the trees, touching down, flying off. Um, one of the uh, military personnel got close enough to touch the side of the thing. Um, they sketched, one of them sketched strange symbols on, on the side of this craft, on its hull, which um, he likened to Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, they do claim that they took photos of it as well, um, but that they were told, uh, some of the United States Air Force witnesses, that, um, oh sorry, you know, there was nothing on the film. It, it was just fogged. Um, obviously, a lot of conspiracy theories have, have uh, grown up uh, as a result of that. Um, the UFO came back on a subsequent night. This, this was um, December 1980. Um, the deputy base commander, um, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, or Lieutenant Colonel, as they say in the States, um, Charles Holt, um, had heard about these UFO sightings. He was at a function and the door burst open and a young airman ran up to him and he said, Sir, it's back. And Holt looked a bit confused and he said for a moment, What? What? What's back? He said, The UFO, sir. The UFO's back. So Holt threw together a team of people. Um, he, he took some powerful uh, generators, light generators called Lytles, into the forest with him. And he, talk, he took also a, a personal dictaphone on, on which he recorded his, his thoughts and observations as he and his team uh, effectively tracked the UFO. And the interesting thing is, his words um, were that he went out to debunk this. In other words, he thought it was all stuff and nonsense, uh, but he couldn't debunk the thing because he ended up becoming a witness to it as well. Um, and I've heard the tape, you can hear the tension and fear even in, in their voices as, as the UFO approaches. Um, at one stage it's firing beams of light down at uh, the military uh, establishment. Um, again, uh, clearly whatever you think UFOs are, these, this has got to be of defence significance it seems to me. Um, and again, a hugely important part of, of the story of, of um, the Rendlesham incident is that when the landing site uh, from the first night's activity was uh, examined. They found three indentations in the ground where this thing had landed, um, perhaps on legs, and those indentations, when, when they were mapped, formed a triangle, so as if this thing had come down on a tripod-like uh, device. And most interestingly of all, when they looked uh, at the area and they ran a Geiger counter over it, they found that um, the radiation readings they recorded were significantly higher than background. And that quote comes from a Ministry of Defence um, uh, assessment done by the Defence Intelligence staff. Um, and surprise, surprise, they peaked those radiation readings in those three indentations where the UFO had, had uh, briefly uh, landed. So all sorts of, of interesting 
things, there are still many unanswered questions about uh, the Rendlesham Forest incident. Many things, frankly, were mishandled. Um, the initial investigation was not uh, done as I would have carried it out. Uh, so far as I can tell, no cordon was established around the landing site to pretend, prevent cross-contamination. Um, no detailed search with metal detectors uh, was, was undertaken. Um, no soil samples were taken. Um, so, in many ways, this was a mishandled investigation. Uh, an intriguing, unanswered question is the removal of certain items of evidence. We don't know what they, they are. It might be the photos, um, it might be other things that are not recorded in, in the files. Um, but the Commander in Chief of the United States Air Force in Europe, uh, General Gabriel, made an unscheduled visit, so far as we know, to uh, Bentwaters Woodbridge uh, after the event, immediate aftermath of the event, and recovered certain items, returned them to his headquarters in, in uh, Rammstein, Germany. Now, uh, the, the file on this, the Ministry of Defence file, makes very interesting reading because um, it, it says somewhat plaintively, um, uh, maybe we could have a look at these these items too, but again there seemed to be no follow-up. So the, the trail, um, I won't say it's gone cold because I know that a lot of people are aggressively using the Freedom of Information Act both in America and in Britain. Um, my, my view now is that I can't rule out an extraterrestrial explanation for some UFO sites. My, my view is that the extraterrestrial hypothesis is, is a possible explanation for that, particularly when you look at um, uh, craft which in terms of, of their speeds and manoeuvres go way beyond um, anything that we've got, uh, including uh, black projects. I can't rule out an extraterrestrial explanation for that. My, my view is that there is some intriguing evidence that would support such a hypothesis, but that there's no hard proof um, that, that could actually put the, uh, the, the matter beyond debate. Well, I think with both UFO sightings and indeed with the alien abduction phenomenon, one could say that in, in a small number of cases, and I want to make that very clear, it's only a small number of cases, psychosis could, could I think, be both the cause of, of, of the experience and indeed the result of it um, in, in different circumstances. Um, it is unquestionable that, that there are some people whose whose mental illness um, will cause, say, delusions, um, and that with some mentally ill people, they will fixate on the UFO or abduction phenomenon, and, and they will uh, see or describe their, their experiences or, or, or such like in that way. Um, but none of this is, is meant to disparage the phenomenon. Um, I, I think one could say that people with psychoses like that will, will fixate on all sorts of different things, often it's religion. Um, so it doesn't come as any surprise that some people um, with psychoses um, uh, would drift into um, the, the field of, of ufology. Um, I think the other, the, the flip side of that is, is um, almost more interesting. Um, could, could some sort of uh, psychosis be the result of, of an experience, whatever that experience might be, and I think unquestionably the answer has to be yes. Um, I, the, the obvious consequence, and I've seen it with, with some people, is, is clearly uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which whether somebody has had a, what, what, we might, what believers might call a genuine encounter with 
say, extraterrestrials, or whether the person simply believes that they have, um, perhaps because they've misidentified something. It's quite possible that that person could be um, profoundly affected by their experience, and the consequences of that might be post-traumatic stress disorder, it might actually go further and become some form of more serious um, uh, psychological or psychiatric condition. Yes, the, certainly the theory that um, quote, psychological delusions, unquote, uh, might explain a number of these reports, has been around for decades, and indeed uh, the Ministry of Defence was, was seizing on that as a potential explanation for some of, of, of the UFO reports, um, certainly as, as early as, as 1951. Um, having said that, it's interesting. Um, yes, I mean, inevitably there will be a, a handful of people with, with um, psychological, psychiatric conditions, um, fantasists, whatever, who, who attach themselves to the UFO uh, subject, um, who come to UFO researchers or to the media with, with stories that have no basis in anything other than, than perhaps some form of delusion. But it's interesting, particularly in relation to the um, abduction phenomenon, there have been a couple of scientific studies done on this um, in America by um, Susan Clancy and Richard McNally. And two that I want to mention uh, briefly, but they're very important. The first one um, was, was really, and, and there have been two or three experiments uh, in, in this, one of which um, was actually run in the UK by Professor Chris French. Um, there have been attempts to look at a control, uh, sorry, at, look at a group of abductees um, and in a double blind experiment to compare and contrast those abductees with, with a control group of non abductees. Now, the first, uh, I'll, I'll call this set of experiments because the, this has been done both in America and Britain, certainly uh, suggest no evidence of any psychopathology in any of the abductees, and that's, that's important in these double-blind experiments. So, um, if you'll forgive me for using an unscientific word, but these people, these people are not mad. Um, none, of that, none of that necessarily means that uh, the experience is, is real, in the sense that some people might use that word, uh, but certainly uh, it tends to suggest that the abductees, or at least the ones that have been uh, tested, um, really aren't suffering from any sort of um, psychological uh, condition. The other experiment was equally interesting, and what, what was done was that, again, in double-blind um, conditions, the group of abductees were asked to relay their experiences. A control group of non-abductees was asked to relay very similar experiences as if it had happened to them and imagine themselves suffering the trauma of it, uh, both physical and, and psychological. Now, interestingly, um, these, these people were being monitored and in the group of abductees and not the, the control group, they found physiological responses such as um, uh, more rapid heart rate, increased perspiration uh, from the abductees. Uh, again, None of this proves that the experiences happened in a real physical sense, but it did suggest uh, that these pe people weren't lying and that they genuinely believed that th these experiences had happened. Belief is hugely important. Um, now, I don't think a belief can of itself generate um, an an experience, certainly not the sorts of physical experiences where, where we've got um, uh, UFOs tracked on radar or, or other physical trace evidence um, where a UFO has landed, where it's been photographed or, or, or such like. Um, but belief, belief is important in, in my opinion, not so much as, as the stimulus for an experience, but in the way in which we interpret experiences. Um, inevitably, I think, how we 
perceive something. Um, that goes not just to UFOs and abduction experiences, but of course much wider. It really covers many, many things in our, our ordinary everyday lives. Belief, your, your beliefs, your knowledge and your cultural background will play a part in how you perceive and interpret um, experiences. I think the example that I can give in relation to this is that imagine a scenario where somebody wakes suddenly and sees a, a shadowy figure at the foot of their bed. Now, if that person um, is, is particularly religious, they might ex perceive that experience. Uh, they might come to believe that, that what they've seen is, is an angel or, or a manifestation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. If that person was a ghost hunter, they might be thinking in, in terms of spirits. If that person was a ufologist, um, or had a knowledge of ufology, inevitably they, they might look at this in, in terms of aliens and, and alien abductions. Now, an interesting um, theory uh, to follow that point up is what if these experiences, whatever they are, um, are a little bit, little bit more amorphous than, than we might suspect. What if there is a phenomenon, but it is neither uh, extraterrestrial, nor religious, nor any of these other explanations. It is amorphous, but it, it collapses into something more tangible when it interacts uh, with the witness. In other words, it, it sort of takes something from the witness's knowledge and culture and belief system and is then uh, perceived and defined in, in that way. And there's an interesting parallel with, with quantum physics and I suppose the, the whole interaction between an event and the observer and the observer actually um, affecting the experiment itself. And I often wonder whether, whether both UFOs, alien abductions and perhaps all manner of other strange phenomena might be explained in a way more akin to quantum physics. Well, I've often been asked um, about the men in black, and on one occasion I remember being asked, and um, uh, the audience uh, began, there was a sort of murmur and then outright laughter, and I realised that in the middle of a uh, denial of this, I was stood up wearing a black suit, <laughs> and, and indeed, of course, I'm <laughs> wearing a black jacket now. But um, uh, I, I think. Undoubtedly, there have been occasions, of course, where uh, government and military personnel have gone to visit UFO witnesses as, as part of the normal investigative uh, process. We don't tend to do it now, but it, it certainly happened in the past. And particularly during the days of the Cold War, I think it's quite possible that um, uh, a conversation was ended with a phrase such as, probably best not to talk about that. Um, for I think fairly understandable reasons, more to do with the, just being the, a sign of the times, just the, the default position back in the days of the Cold War was not to discuss anything to do with uh, the government and the military and intelligence. I think there's a world of difference between that and suggesting that there's some sort of um, agency going around silencing UFO witnesses and, and researchers. I mean, actually, if there were, they're an extraordinary inept agency because of course <laughs> there are cool sort of TV programs, DVDs, radio shows, um, you know, <laughs> a, a, absolutely. Um, so I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't hold um, much for that theory. Um, I think there are potentially another couple of points worth mentioning. It's quite possible to me, it's well known that um, in the UFO research community, many of the individual researchers and groups hate each other and are in uh, competition with each other. So it's quite possible that um, somebody perhaps uh, gets uh, a whiff of, of an interesting case um, and then goes and visits the witness and thinks, well, I'll, I'll pretend to be from the government and I might get some more information. It's possible that we're dealing with uh, Walter Mitty-type fantasists. Um, it's well known and documented that there are 
uh, people who, who dress up uh, as police officers, as paramedics, um, and actually go to the, the lengths to, to get the um, uh, correct uniforms, vehicles, etc. As, as part of a, uh, a, a sort of fantasy, um, it's probably quite glamorous to portray yourself if you're going to have that sort of ultimate fantasy as part of a, a sinister government um, conspiracy and, and group of people in charge of, of the truth about extraterrestrials and UFOs. It's also possible that some of the people who claim uh, to have been visited by sinister men in black are simply not being truthful when they make those claims. So again, I don't think there's one neat answer. There may be a lot of different things going on. But um, I'm, despite the way I'm dressed, I'm not, I'm not some sort of real man in black. We just asked the question which leads on from that, which is what a lot of people want to know. Um, yes, indeed. You then. are wearing black, you've left the MOD, or are you a stooge? <laughs> No, it's a simple it question. Is a, yeah. It is, sure. And you want sure. to answer it. Yeah, I want, want to answer it, answer it yes. because it, 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 it is a question. Your you've got to oh, it's, it. it's all over the internet, so yeah, yeah sure. Well, well, ever since I spoke out publicly about the, the UFO phenomenon, I've been accused by uh, certain uh, UFO researchers and conspiracy theorists of being uh, a disinformation agent, being part of the cover-up, but being somehow put out as the friendly face. Uh, designed to encourage UFO groups to send their reports uh, to the government, uh, designed to uh, mislead people and plant false stories, etc. etc. Um, those stories uh, first surfaced as soon as I spoke out. Um, they haven't just started, now I've left the MOD. Um, in a sense, let me do what of course I can only do, um, deny them. It's simply not true. I'm not a disinformation agent, but I won't say much more than that because frankly there's no point. The sorts of people that believe I am are, are probably so um, uh, wedded to the idea um, of, of a cover-up and a conspiracy that nothing I say is going to change their mind. I'm not going to deny it and, and then okay. have them turn around and say, oh all right then. Uh, <laughs> because he's denying it. The, the, the denial with those sorts of people is, is simply seen as, as reinforcement of their own belief system, so perhaps it says more about them than it says about me. But let me clarify um, why I did leave the MOD. Um, I, I left simply because having done 21 years uh, working uh, for the government, I, I just felt that it was time uh, to move on. Uh, I've got a number of outside business interests and I just wanted to uh, uh, spend, spend more time uh, pursuing those business interests. I, I didn't leave because I, I had got too close to the truth, I, didn't, I wasn't forced out, uh, I'm still um, very friendly with, with um, all, all sorts of uh, former colleagues, I get invited back on a a regular basis. I, of course some people say oh he hasn't really left at all, he's, he's just um, he's sort of pretending that he has but he's really still on the payroll and he's, he's still gathering information, planting this information etc etc. No, I, I left, I had a tremendous time, I very much enjoyed my 21 years of government service, I've done some fascinating things, not just the UFO project, all sorts of other things, but it was simply time for um, something else, fresh challenges. Have you, have you ever met Scully and Mulder? I, I've never, I've never met, um, you, you mean uh, the actors, the I, I've never met David Duchovny or, or Gillian Anderson, I particularly like to meet Gillian Anderson, Gillian Anderson and I have on several occasions um, expressed a, a desire to work with her on, on various projects and no, I, I think actually joking aside it would be a good in joke and I, honestly I haven't got any ulterior motive for that whatsoever.